I coached high jump that entire time. I high jumped in high school. I high jumped in college. Um, and then when I started coaching, no one wanted to take high jump on. So as a head coach, you have to step up and do that sometimes. Um, and I've been hearing more and more over the last few years, field design coaches are becoming really hard to find. Um, high jump pole, those coaches are rare and special, and if you get, get one, you hang on to them for all your work. So consequently, a lot of coaches, even if you've been coaching a long time, you've had to step into the role of high jump coach. And high jump is a pretty um, technical event. There are a lot of moving pieces and parts to it. So as a new high jump coach, you tend to think, what am I supposed to do now? I don't even know where to start. I don't even know where to start with steps. So what I would like to talk about today is where do you start with steps? If you're a new high jump coach or you're a coach who's been handed high jump, what do you do? Because as you know, the high school season starts and you have two weeks till your first meet. And if you're a new high jump coach, you're like, how am I gonna get kids over the bar in two weeks? What am I gonna do? We've all been there, you know, in one, one event or another. So I'm gonna talk about high jump today. This is not expert high jump. This is not um, all the plyos you'll need to do, the strength you'll need to do, the speed work you'll need to do. There have been lots of sessions on that. And we do train all of that in our sprint program, our jumpers go through our sprint program. What I'm gonna focus on today is strictly high jump. Strictly high jump drills. Um, we have a pretty large team, so in any given year, I coach the boys and the girls in high jump, I probably have 10 to 15 girls and 10 to 15 boys. So it's also high volume. So I'm, I'm giving you things that if you have a lot of kids who want to try it, these are some simple drills that you can run a lot of kids through. They're not going to take tons of time. It won't take the whole practice. You can do them. Um, I'm going to talk about how to recruit high jumpers. I'm going to give you some drills. And I've got video to go with the drills. Uh, I am no longer demonstrating things like high jumping, triple jump. On the advice of my doctor, after years of having to visit her after the start of the track season. So I have um, videos that will demonstrate those. And then we're gonna talk about the approach and how to get them actually over the bar. So hopefully when you leave, you'll have some practical things that you can try and do in the first two weeks of practice to help get your high jump kids going. If you have any questions, I would say ask them as we go through it. If you need something explained in a different way or you have questions about a drill, just go ahead and ask while we have it up there. Um, all right, I, I use the internet a lot. I use other coaches as a resource. Um, as your season gets going, say you're at a meet and some school's got really good high jumpers, go talk to the high jump coach. I do it all the time. Hey, what, what drills do you do? Have you ever tried this? Hey, I have a kid with this problem. Have you ever seen that? Coaches are generally speaking super helpful and very willing to share information. Um, it's not like you're giving away the store or trade secrets. The goal is for kids to get better and coaches generally are okay with it. So, first is recruitment. Okay, you probably have at least one or two kids who have jumped in the program that you can count on to kind of lead the way. And the first thing I'll do is ask those kids, okay, who else do you think should be high jumping? Because they know. They know who's springy, they know who's hoppy, they know who most likely will slide into that high jump spot. They're a great resource. The next thing I do is attend other sporting events. I go to volleyball, I go to basketball, I go to soccer, um, try to get to hockey. I'm a total creeper. And I'm checking out kids' inseams and calf muscles, and I don't just limit myself to the athletes who are playing, especially at basketball. There are a lot of siblings running around, so I'm always, hey, how old are you? What grade 
grade are you in? Have you thought about doing track? Because they look really off and athletic. Um, my husband thinks I, I, I get a little, he's like, you need to let them know you're the track coach so they don't think you're some random stalker. Um, but I get a lot of kids out by just asking them. I would say probably 95% of the kids I talk to, when you say, have you ever thought about track? What's the first thing they say? What's the first thing you hear from kids? I don't like running. Well, I'm not talking about running, I'm talking about jumping. It never occurs to them that there's another whole area of track they could do, like jumping and throwing and hurling. Their mind immediately goes to, well, track means I'm gonna have to run tons of miles. I'm gonna have to run for an hour. Well, no, you don't. And there's jumping, and as soon as they hear there's an alternative, they're much more willing to give it a try. Now, two sports that are completely overlooked for high jumpers, dance line and ice skating. And we have a huge ice skating program in Rochester, figure skating program. Some of my best jumpers have come from figure skating. And not just high jump, but long and triple jump as well. They're used to going off the ice, going off of one foot, controlling your bodies in the air, all things you need when you're jumping. So those are two areas um, that people don't normally look into that I can highly recommend. Look for those skaters and look for those dance girls. Because again, dance girls, once you get rid of the pointy toe all the time, they have really good body control. And they're very limber and springy, elastic, all the things you need for jumping. Um, I put up there, don't overlook atypical body types. Okay, because when you say high jumper, of course you think, tall and thin, legs that go for miles. And that's, uh, there are a lot of high jumpers out there who look like that. But you can also have somebody my height who's got, you know, a 32 inch vertical leap and calves for days, super springy. You wouldn't want to overlook that person just because they're not tall and thin. When I first started coaching in the early 2000s, um, we had a thrower at Century, Carl Erickson, who won the shot in the disc two years in a row at State. Before he won the shot of disc at state, I took him to state in the high jump. He was a high jumper, he was a thrower. So don't overlook, don't be just um, so set on finding that six foot two kid or five foot 11 girl that you overlook somebody else who might be really good at it. Um, and the last thing I do is have every single person on the team go over bar. I say bar, but it's actually the bungee. Um, and we do not have, usually at the start of the season, we don't have anywhere outside to jump. We don't really have anywhere inside to jump either. So we use a wrestling room and we drag <coughs> in a section of a high jump pit, not the whole thing, just one section. Bring in the standards, bring in a bungee. It's big enough that we can do short approach and we can send everybody over the bar in a very relaxed fashion. We make it fun. I have somebody demonstrate what it's supposed to look like, and then I just let the kids try it. There's no coaching in this part, because I want to see who has it and who doesn't. And even if you're new to high jump, you're going to be able to see a couple things. One, can a kid go off of one foot? Because if you can't go off one foot, you can't high jump. Okay, a lot of times kids will run up, stop, and try to jump off with two feet. That is not a jump. Um, and if that's what they're prone to doing when we're just going over the bar this way, I mentally shut them off my way. Okay, so we send everybody through. Distance throwers, sprinters, curlers, everyone goes through. And from that, I comp compile a list of names. I actually have two lists. I have a list of people I think should high jump. And then I also make a list of the people who say they just want to high jump. Because after all, um, this is not just varsity track, this is JV and varsity track. And there are some kids who want a high jump, who clearly maybe should put their time and effort into a different direction, but I am not going to lead off by telling them, no, you can't high jump because you don't look like you'll be good at it. I don't want to do that. I want to give them an opportunity to go through the motions of learning it, to try it in a meet, and come to decide on their own, yeah, maybe this isn't for me, or 
it's okay if I can only clear four feet. I really enjoy doing this and I want to stick with it. You know, part of being in track is to give them that kind of opportunity. There's no riding the bench. So I have a list of people I want to jump, and then I have my other list. So the key thing with the other list is for the first two weeks or until we get outside and we have pits we can work with, I'm not going to be working with you quite yet. You're going to have to wait. We will do it, but I need to get to this group first because we have a meet in two, work, in two weeks and i got to come up with some jumpers. So I put you know one group to the side, not to be completely thrown away, but we'll work when we have the space and time to do it. So I start with that, that other group. Okay, so you have your jumping group. Now what? And this is, again, I'm going to give you guys basic things for new, new kids you have high jumping. Your veteran high jumpers can also do all these drills. They'll know these drills. Your veteran high jumpers, you can say, hey, go do your set of drills while I work with the younger kids. They will know these. So I'm not going to you know, get into that. We're talking about new, new kids you have who have never high jumped before. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about are drills, the approach, and getting over the bar. Okay, so I've listed the drills, the, some basic drills. I'm going to go over them one at, the, one at a time so you don't have to worry about um, getting all these written down. I'm going to go over them one at a time and, and give you examples. So you can use all of them, you can use some of them. I would not suggest you use none of them because some of them are really good. Um, and again, these are just some basic drills to get you started if you don't have, if you can't be outside right away, if you don't have a lot of space, you can do these just about anywhere. I wanted them to be really user friendly so it's not dependent on the size of your field house or how many kids you have or whatever. You can do most of these anywhere. Um, so we have same arm, same leg, wrestler's bridge, circle run, scissor kicking, popovers, and a short approach. Okay, so before we start the drills, you need to have the kids figure out if they're going to be approaching from the right or approaching from the left. Generally speaking, if you're right-handed, you're going to be approaching from the right. So you'll plant with your left foot, you'll take off with your right. Same thing on the left, you'll be, if you approach from the left, you'll plant with your right foot, take off with your left foot. Occasionally, we have an ambidextrous kid. There's always, it seems to be one in every crowd. Way to throw a monkey wrench and everything. So what we do is have them go both sides um, over the bungee and ask what feels more natural. Okay, well if they say right, we'll go from the right. And if it looks just really awkward and not working, then we'll switch them over to the left. There seems to always be one of those kids who wants to go from either side. So once you know what direction they're coming for, coming from, then we can start with the drills. Okay, so same arm, same leg. I had, um, I want to, just an aside here, the athlete I have demonstrating all of these was a century athlete who just finished up her track career at ASU. And two weeks ago, she embarked on her professional track career. She's going to try to qualify for the Olympic trials in the tech. So she was kind enough because she's in Arizona. And I'm like, I'm doing this high jump thing in winter, and I don't have access to any high jump equipment. So she filmed all the sample drills for me. So I just I want to give her a shout out kind of as a thank you. So same arm, same leg. You, depending on where the athlete approaches from, is the side they'll stand. If you have, if you're out on the pit, you can do this drill in a gym. You can do it just along the wall. You can do this drill down a hallway. It's very simple. It's to help kids get used to the same arm, the same leg. Okay, so it's same arm, same leg. Really simple. really simple to us as a coach who are really good with our biomechanics, but to a kid coming out for high jump who's used to running opposite arm, opposite leg, totally throws them off. 
So we do a lot of walk, walk, same arm, lift your arm and your leg at the same time. And you can do that down the hallway. I mean, you don't have to do it on a pit. Um, I tell kids a lot, if you shoot a layup in basketball, it's the same principle, same arm, same leg. Okay, so that way they kind of understand what that means. Why is it important? Because it's a basic, fundamental movement you need to get over the high jump. If you can't do this, you're not gonna get over the high jump. So it's just a basic, the most basic move. So these drills are designed, um, I've kind of split out the whole high jump um, motion activity. I've broken it down into drills for each piece of it. So you do each of these drills, and then you put it all together, and that going over the bar makes more sense. This can take 30 to 60 seconds. It's not like you have to do this for 10 minutes. So it's something really quick that you start with to warm up. And obviously, if you're left, you do it the left way. OK, the next one is scissor kicking over the bar. Again, come from your left or your right. If you don't have access to a pit right away, you can, you know. I'm um, not sure I understand. Oh, sorry, sweetie. <laughs> you can um, paper line down on the floor. You can, if you just have, you know, a mat, they can scissor kick up onto the mat. You can set up just a small hurdle. It's just something to get them scissor kicking, think about lifting your, lifting your knee. And again, if you're right-handed, your scissor kick starts with your right leg. If you're left-handed, your scissor kick starts with your left leg. Katie is a left side jumper, so everything she's doing is from, from the left. Okay, and I'll show that again. Just a simple, you stay upright, easy peasy. Okay, it, high jump is also about um, confidence and lack of fear. So as you introduce things to kids, this is why we go slow and they're not going over the bar backwards yet or upside down yet. We're getting them used to it. And I use a bungee instead of a bar because the bar hurts. If you've ever been a high jumper and you have landed on the bar at some point in your career, it hurts. Sometimes it leaves a mark. And especially for girls, they become immediately afraid of the bar. Then you hear all the time, but I'm afraid of the bar. I'm afraid of the bar. So we start with a bungee to make it really user friendly so there's no fear of getting hurt. And I wait till the very last possible second to introduce the bar. Um, so everything here we have, we're doing with the bungee. Okay, the next thing we do is circle run. So if you, you've gone to any of the other high jump um, <laughs> presentations, you know, they talk about the turn through the curve, holding your lean. Um, the circle run is designed to help kids figure this out. So we basically have them run in a small circle. So what does that do for you? When you um, do your approach, you can be too fast, you can have your speed right on or you can be too slow. So if you're too fast, you know, you'll slide out of that approach and it, it makes for a horrible jump. So in the circle run, you can see when they're going too fast because they get super like, super leany, not just a little leany, but way leany. And in that little circle, you have a chance to say, too fast, slow that down. Okay, but if they slow down too much in the circle run, there's no lean at all. You can see they can cheat, and this is the number one thing um, new high jumpers do. They slow down so they can not have to lean through the turn, because leaning through the turn to them is really scary. It feels unnatural. They don't want to do it, um, and their, their mind's way of dealing with that is they slow down in their turn, so that they can stand back up and not have to be leaning. So doing the circle runs at the correct speed 
gives them body awareness. They get used to, okay, this is how it's supposed to feel. That's normal in the high jump. That's too fast. That's too slow. We're looking for that optimum speed, and this drill helps with that. And again, you can do this in the gym. You can do it, you know, on the tarmac. You can do it, you know, wherever there's room to run a circle. And it's just running a circle at a decent clip. So they get used to leaning. And I will, a lot of times, if I have 10 kids, I'll make two circles of five. And they just chase each other around the circle. And then they think that's fun too. I mean, then you have, always have the left-handed person who runs on the outside of the circle. So uh, they enjoy this one, and it's just a good learning tool for when you get to the approach. Is there other size for that circle that you normally use? Um, I want to say probably mm, five to eight meters across. You know, if it gets too big, that's not realistic to what your turn is going to look like um, on the approach. And if it's too small, if it's too tight, that's then, then you're just all turn and all lean, and you, you, you know, that's not how your approach is going to look either. So, um, if you don't feel like the kids are running the appropriate size circle, set up a circle of cones or draw a chalk circle. You could run around the key on a basketball court if that's if you happen to be in the gym. Um, that's a good place to run and get it done. Do you give them any idea about the um, strikes, how they should run or anything? Or just uh, speed? Not in this, not in this section. Because here's here's what we have. Okay, you have your better high jumpers who can be more boundy in their approach, but your new jumpers, to them, boundy is just slow. And if they bound, they're not gonna, they get no lean, they're not gonna get over the bar. So for our newer jumpers, um, we talk more about carrying speed into the jump. And you're finding that sweet spot of speed, not so fast that you're out of control, but for them, for new jumpers, speed translates into lean, which translates into height. Um, once they get better, we work on that approach and you know, change it to more of the bound. But for new kids, speed is your friend. Because the other thing that happens with new kids and no speed is they jump up, stall out in the middle of their jump, and they come down right on the bar. And that, then it's, Holy cow, that hurt, I'm never jumping again. Why did that hurt so much? So we tend to, with new kids, work on work with speed. Appropriate speed, but speed. Okay, so once we've done that, and again, we're talking just a minute or less for these drills. They're really, they're quick, but they hit all the points you want to hit before you get to actually jumping. So the next one we do is a wrestler's bridge. And it's back bend, okay? In my experience, girls are able to do this pretty easily, boys are not. So, some boys can, but wow, I would say the vast majority of my boys cannot. Um, so what I do is bring out one of those big blue exercise balls. So if you have them squat in front of the exercise ball and lean their back into it, with whatever hand they go over the bar with, the hand goes up, the head goes back, and they roll along the back of the exercise ball. So their back bends, you know, mimicking the shape of the exercise ball. It doesn't hurt because the ball is squishy, but it makes them be in that arch position that they can't get by themselves in the wrestler's bridge. And this is important because this is the shape you want over the bar. Unfortunately, you're gonna see a lot of chair shape over the bar. So we practice this so they know what it feels like. Oh, that hurts, oh, my back. I'm like, yeah, that's why we're gonna do this a few times, you know, because you need to get used to doing that with your back. But again, 
super short, you can do this anywhere, inside, outside, hallway, um, restaurant, but. Okay, so this is actually my favorite drill that we do because this one um, is really good at replicating the actual action in the air. So our back's warmed up, um, we're ready to try going over the bungee. And this is called Popovers or Frog Jumps, I've heard it both ways. So I'm gonna show it to you, then explain it to you, and I'll show it to you again. Okay, so popover is just a simple up and over. Okay. So you stand with your back to the bar, to the bungee. You're, you're, you want to be a good foot, foot and a half out in front, okay? Here's what you're looking for. You're looking for some knee bend because you want to use your legs to get into this jump. You want to see some arm movement because new kids tend to do this. They want to hold it all right here. They don't understand that, no, your arms help you get over. So they like to hold them here. So you want this. You want to see some up before you go over. A lot of kids tend to do, fling themselves back right away. There's no jumping involved. They just go backwards. You have to go up before you go over that bungee. The most important thing I feel like this drill demonstrates is the head layback. And you have got to have head layback in high jump. Okay, I explain it to the kids this way. If you're just standing around, if you tuck your head in, what happens to your back and your butt? Well, they pop out. So if you're going over the bar and you tuck your head too soon and have no head lay back, what's well, going to hit the bar? Your butt. But if you're standing here and you lay your head back, what automatically happens to your back and your butt? You get a nice arch just standing here. So now multiply that when you're going over the, over the bar. So to help teach that head lay back, because kids, of course, will say 100% of the time, oh, but I did, I did. Did you? So what I do is I go and stand around the back of the pit. Like if this is the high jump area, okay, my athlete would be here, ready to jump. I stand back here. If you have properly laid your head back, you should be able to make eye contact with me. I should see your eyeballs as your head goes over the bar. Okay, so 95% of them, I don't even see the top of their head. So then, of course, they're like, well, we thought, we, did you see my eyes? Well, no, I didn't really. So my batter jumpers like it when I stand back there and hold up a certain number of fingers and they have to tell me how many fingers I'm holding up. They like doing this because once you figure out how to lay your head back, jumping like magically opens up into this new thing where I might be able to jump high because that is such an important part of high jump. Okay, if your head is laid back properly, you can't be sitting in a, you know, going over in a seated position. It just, this drill, we hit um, more than just a minute or two. And when we're outside and we have the full high jump hit, you can have two people go at the same time to move people through. But this is just an excellent jump. You tell them as they hit the mat, think about doing a backward somersault. Okay, if you're just, if you just go and land on your butt, again, you're not doing it correctly. I like this because it's easy to see what they're doing wrong. They can feel what they're doing wrong right away and go back and retry it. So this is one, all of our jumpers, from our newest to our best, we do this one a lot. And we've had a lot of good success using this drill. If this is a good one when you go to a meet, they always need to hit the mat and do a few of these before they get started. And that's why. You want to just get everything going in that nice <coughs> layback position. Okay, any questions on that? What height do you put the bungee at? So, I keep the bungee um, 
slow for success purposes. So, you know, for girls it might be at four feet. Um, if I'm just working with my varsity jumpers, then I move it up. But when I've got everybody together for my new kids, which is what we have here, I put everything about four feet. Because if you go to a, a meet, 310 or four feet is generally the opening height for girls. Okay, for the boys, the variety of boys I get is a lot harder with the boys because seventh and eighth grade boys and 16 year old boys, they can be sometimes a foot and a half apart in just their height. So I kind of, I'll have a group that will come through for the boys, for the brand new boys that I don't know if they're that springy yet. We're looking at four six ish, four seven. For better boys, I start at like five feet, five two. Um, it really again, the key is you want to give these kids success. And if you put it up too high, they don't have any chance for success, and then they're already disappointed and thinking they don't want to do it. So it's easy to, yeah, look at how you got over that. See, that wasn't so bad. Yes. You just made the point I was going to bring up. Oh, yeah, okay. And the last thing we do with this, this is good for, is the um, kind of throw away, I think, sometimes in high jump, and that's to kick your heels as you go over the bar. A lot of kids jump passively because they can jump so high. Ooh, we've got this nice layback that we totally forget we're supposed to be doing something with our legs as they pull the bar off their way over and then, oh, the bar falls because you didn't do anything with your feet and you pulled it right up. So this also, as you do the, um, you know, you can work on, you can see how she kicks her feet up, flips her feet, it also, so you hit all the phases of that jump right here without having the complexity of the approach added on. That's why I really like this drawing. Okay, so once we've done all of that, when we're ready to start introducing actual high jumping, we do a short approach to the bar. Okay, because a short approach is less scary than a full approach. And again, low height, bungees at four feet, um, three to five steps back, Let's put everything we worked on together. The three to five steps is all through the turn. Okay, so you're encouraging a low lean. They should have some good speed. This isn't walk up to the bar and try to jump over it. You need to take some speed through that. And up and over, and let's see what you got. So it's just a short approach where you're trying to put everything together. How far away are they starting for that short approach? So we go three to five steps. Okay. So I have them just jog back three to five steps. Because um, I don't, you know, I want it close enough where it's not a big production, but far enough that they have to go through that turn. And the short approach is also good for kind of eyeballing what their tendency on that turn is. Okay, some kids, three to five steps, you know, I'll have them facing the bar and their first step is immediately this way because they want to do this C shape that is just not going to work. Or some kids do this and you can catch that right away off their short approach and fix it right there as opposed to waiting till they're halfway through appro their approach and their approach is wonky in four different ways, you can at least isolate that turn by doing the short approach. And it gives them the feel of going over the bar, okay, without again being in a scary situation. I just cannot, especially for girls, overemphasize how this scares a lot of girls to have to do. Girls who could be really good at high jumping. So less is more when you're trying to get them into doing this. Boys, typically, they're like, throw that thing up to six feet, I can do it. <laughs> no, you can't. But, <laughs> come on, watch me. And then they just fling themselves using no high jump form whatsoever. So that's the opposite end 
that you want to also pull back. So that is shorter pull. So we do probably five to 10 shorter pull shirts. You know, and that also depends on, sometimes depends on the amount of kids I have jumping on that particular day. If I've got 15 kids, we probably aren't gonna be doing as many shorter pull shirts. Yes? Where do you have them start their job back from? I know you probably okay, start good question. All this is gonna come up in, in the approach, but I can tell you now too. So the way we do it is, um, in fact, I'm gonna go to the next screen because then I can just show you. So let's say you have the high jump standard is right here. Our optimal takeoff point is right here. Kind of right in the middle of that fat arrow. Okay, so I'll just go right into the approach. We use a J approach and I will die on that hill. There is not a high jumper around who will tell you to do any other shape for your approach. Not a C because you can lose all your lean if you use a C. Not a like straight diagonal line. The J is the optimal approach. I could throw out all the physics for you, but I'm not gonna do that because this is basic high jump. If you wanna Google that, it's everywhere. So we use a J approach. When it's time to do the approach, okay, there are probably as many ways to get your approach as there are high jump coaches. So what I am giving you today is the quick and dirty way to get your approach done. If you have 20 kids you need to get through an approach, it's gonna take X amount of time. This is the most efficient way I have hit upon doing that. That's not to say you have to do it this way, not to say there's not another equally good way. This is just what I have found to work really well for beginner athletes, okay? So what I typically do is if we're outside, I chalk or put cones down in the shape of that J because they won't see it. And if I chalk a J on there, that gives them a really clear visual of the shape we expect them to take. Okay, you'd be shocked at how many kids don't know the alphabet when it comes to, we're doing a J turn. That was not a J. I don't know what letter that was. Um, so I just lay it down there for them so there can be no, no confusion. And again, we start, this is the position we start from. So um, we will start, I'll have them put their arm out to the bar and that's how far from the bar out they start. High jump is a lot like hurdling. Kids think you have to be six inches away from the hurdle or the bar to take off and make it over. That is not the case. You need to be much further away than what they think it should be. So many missed jumps happen because they're way too close to the bar on stage. <coughs> so we want to be, we want to be further, good arm length away. Now, obviously, the taller kid you have, his arm's going to be longer. That's okay. He should be taking away further away. So that's kind of why we use the arm as measurement. The other thing is we have you take off here because new kids like to travel along that bar. If you're taking off here as a new kid who travels, you are going to land off the pit. And I see it happen all the time. And you know, you see it coming. They, instead of taking off here, they get nervous because that's at the end of the pit. And there's this whole big pit right there that I need to take four little extra steps to get to the middle and take off, and then you know it's gonna be a disaster. In your head, you're going, stop, don't wait, run through, don't jump from there. Um, so that's why we have them take off, you know, on, on the pole to the screen. So once you have that, and what I usually do, Put a big X there, so they generally speaking know that we're taking off. Everything is going to have to be adjusted. I know that. Okay. Anything we do here, depending on the weather, the track surface, the direction the wind is coming, everything is going to have to be adjusted. This isn't set in stone. This is to give you um, a consistent place to start from. 
okay? Rather than having to make up a new one every time you go, doing this, getting an approach, measuring it, gives you a consistent place to start from as a coach, where you can make your adjustments, not starting from scratch every time. Okay, so once we have their starting point, I line the kids up from there. Typically, we use an even number of steps. I usually use eight steps for beginner. Some of my faster learner like kids go 10 steps. Some better kids go 12 steps. But generally, we start with about eight steps. Okay? You can use an odd number of steps. It's totally up to you. We just use even. Um, and if you're using an even number of steps, your first step, if you're jumping from the right, your first step should be with your right foot. Jump from the left, your first step should be with your left foot. Okay, so we start them on that. They run the J in reverse. Okay, and I always tell them, um, you need to go faster than a jog, probably a little faster than a stride, not an all-out sprint, but you need to go fast. You run, I will count the steps. So they run, I count the steps, and mark, mark with chalk on the tarmac. If we're in the gym and having to do those, um, I just put a piece of tape down and put a mark where they finish. Now, if you as a coach see their, their run back and you're like, oh, that's way too slow, that is not gonna work. You make them go back and do it again. Okay, you have them do it as many times till you have the speed and um, intentionality that you think they need to have. Because kids just starting to do this they have no idea what they're doing. So they jog, or they sprint, or they half run, half stutter step, try to count themselves and slow down. You want a consistent approach. So you make them do it until you're satisfied that, okay, if they were actually doing the high jump, that's how I want them to look on their approach. That's why this, the approach is the most time consuming thing do, but once you've done it once and you have it, you never have to go back to that. That's the beauty of this. So we have all the kids do their, run their approach back, make their march for them. And if we're outside, I have them bring their spikes because approaching in your trainers and approaching in your spikes will give you vastly different results. So I have them do this in their spikes. All the drills are done in your, just your regular shoes, but for the approach, we use your spikes so we can be accurate. So once we have all of their marks done, they line up and run back through the other way. So we can see where their plant foot is. And I don't have them jump over the bar, they do that same arm the same way. So when you get to your eight steps, just go straight up, same arm, same way, and we'll see where you're at. We typically, our, our approaches, we do half on the straight, half at the turn. So if you're eight steps, that should be four on the straight, four on the turn. If you're 10 steps, it's five and five. Okay, that's another easy way to, when they're actually jumping, um, and you can't draw that J for your kids on the tarmac, it's easy to check their steps. Like, if you're only taking, say, three steps on the straight, and then you turn, that's gonna cause them to turn high and come into the, you're gonna see that. If you go too low, if you're taking six steps and then you just try to swing your turn, they're gonna come in way too low and flat. They won't have any, any lean anyway. So tell, giving them a cue like four steps straight ahead and then four steps in your turn gives them kind of a plan and it helps you identify what might be a problem in their approach. Um, we, I don't know if I have this on there. That's measuring. Okay, so before I, I get that done, um, also on the approach, I want to say really emphasize the intentionality of your first step. Because another thing I see with young, new jumpers is they're not really thinking about their first step. 
So that being the case, sometimes their step is a foot. Sometimes their step is a foot and a half. Sometimes they go off their own foot. It's different every time, and then bam, your approach has changed. Something that simple totally screws up your approach. Um, and they don't see it that way. They're like, what, it's just a first step. I'm just taking a first step. Yeah, okay. Let me put a chalk mark where you've taken your first step, and then you'll see it in four different places, and a step is not just a step. So we teach our kids, much like in the long and triple jump, we want to be intentional with that first step. Got some rocking back, some gathering, so that your first step is a good first step. It should be, your steps should be big. We shouldn't have any tiny steps in our approach. Okay, the other place you'll see tiny steps is in the middle of their turn. Because they get nervous about leading in that turn, so rather than commit with the speed and the lean, they'll throw in five little tiny star steps because that's so much more safe when you're going over high jump bar. Um, so those are the two places where you really see problems with the approach. Is that in the middle of the turn where they stutter step and then at the start when they're taking a different length step. Okay, when you have them do, when I have them do the run back, they need to hit the same takeoff point three times before I say let's measure that. Because anybody can hit it once, but you want them to be able to hit it every time they do it. Consistency is key. So if they can hit it three times, then we go ahead and measure it. Okay, again, knowing that it's going to change. We're gonna have to make adjustments at a meet based on the weather, how many events they've done um, before they're taking their next jump. You're making adjustments all the time, but this gives us a starting point rather than having to come up with a new starting point every single meet. Okay, any questions on that? Yes? So if they're a little more tired or you know, coming out a sprint? You have to, lots of times you have to push up because their steps are, the more tired they get, the slower they go, their steps get more choppy, so you might have to push them up and, you know, depending on, um, yeah, how, how they feel. You know, and again, double down on that, if they're tired and they're jumping into a headwind, then you're really screwed because you're tired and you're running into a wind. So you do have to make, it just like if you have a tailwind, that's gonna push them into the bar. So you have to make adjustments, but at least this way, you have a mark to start from and you're not starting from scratch. Now, if you get in a pinch at a meet, you can always use this to find your mark. That's the beauty of what I think this is. Um, there have been times where, boy, I know you'll be shocked. What are your measurements? Well, I forgot them. Well, I don't know where my clipboard is. So-and-so has it. Where, I don't know what my measurements are. I, they're gonna close the pit. I need to do something. You can have them run back and mark it and use that as their measurement for the day because at least that gives you something to work with. Okay, it's handy in a pinch, in an emergency, of which with high school kids, they're, they're often, often have emergencies. So once you've, you've got that, then we wanna do the measurements. Again, there are a variety of ways to measure. Some people measure all three legs of the triangle. Um, we just do two, we don't do the hypotenuse, we can use the other leg. I'm just telling you the way I do it. If you Google it, you'll probably find a ton of other ways to do it. Totally okay. The important thing is that you have a measurement that you can recreate on a daily basis. So what we do, so let's say this is the mark of, of you know, where your kid is gonna start from. Okay, the, the athlete holds one end of the tape measure. Usually it's me, because I want it to be done right. I'm not on this end. You should make your, you are, you are dead across from the high jump standard upright. Okay, that's gonna be this line, and this line is straight back to your athlete. So, he'll hold one end, I'll hold the end where you have to actually measure, because again, I want it to be accurate. I write down that measurement. Then they bring me the tape measure, and we turn, 
and we, me we measure, we use the outside of the upright. I, some people use the box that the standard is on. I do not because boxes are different sizes. So we use the outside edge of that standard. Then I write it down. I write it down on a sheet of paper that I have. I put it in my phone. I um, post it in our classroom, like 10 different places so these kids can get their measurements. Because you get to a meet, and if high jump isn't the only thing you're doing, you're trying to be four places at one time, and I get, my phone is blowing up, where are my measurements? I don't have my measurements. So I try to put it as many places as I can so that they have it. Yes? I will also use two, two tape measures so that we can get a 90 degree angle. Yeah. Sometimes when they go fast, it's not 90 degrees, you know, turn the left or right. Yeah. So I'll yeah. use two at the same time. That's an excellent idea. So then once you have those measurements down and you throw them down, you can always make adjustments. But you know that that's a good starting spot for that athlete. And that's, that's the most important thing is you have a good starting spot. You don't have time in a meet to come up with a whole new, if you had to do that every meet for every jumper you had, you'd be a, a, just a total wreck. So this helps you as a coach have a good jumping off point every time you go to a meet. Yes? A lot of my jumpers are also horizontals. You know what I tell them when we get to a meet? As soon as they get off the bus, yep. they'll go get their horizontal marks down. 100%. High jump is second because the standards may not yep. yet be set. Yep. And we often, um, <clears throat> as kids get older and more responsible, I might say to one of my junior or senior girls, you know, where you, you know, here are all the marks, go get them late. Because I know so-and-so is also doing this event and she might not get over and I know this girl will go to the bathroom 10 times before she makes it over here and the pits will be, you know, people will be doing run-throughs and then you don't have time to lay your marks. So I sometimes have, you know, my more re kids I know are responsible who have done it for years. Hey, just go lay everybody's marks. Um, that's, that's also helpful because the start of the meet, it can be absolutely chaotic. Yes. Do you see a, a tendency or a pattern during the season? like an evolution of the approach and getting differences. I've done horizontal and sometimes they get stronger and they really yes. keep growing. Do yes. you see something like? You do, and I have I have one boy who jumps, and he's a really good jumper. Um, every hike, he pushes, I have to back him up literally every hike because he gets faster and gets in closer to the bar every time, and I have, tried for three years to break him of that, and I can't, so now I just make the adjustment. I know that that's what's gonna happen. His first takeoff is gonna be right here where I want it, and the next time he jumps, he's gonna be in like a foot and a half too close, and so I need to back him up. I just back him up right away. So yeah, yeah, I've seen it. And as kids get more confident running and jumping, Yes, you, you make those adjustments because they get better at it. This is, remember, we're talking basic kids starting on the high jump. This is the lowest bar possible for them to have success, to make this easy for them, to not throw so much at them um, that it becomes an obstacle to actually doing the event. So this is just the easiest way to get them going. Because again, remember, Two weeks into the season is your first meet. Probably three to four weeks is your first JV varsity meet where everyone is together. So that's not a lot of time. You can't, you don't have hours to spend perfecting things with new kids. You have to get them as through as much as you can in the time that you have, knowing that they're also doing other events. Um, okay, so now we're going over the bar. So the day finally comes where we're going to let them go over the bungee. I said bar, but I mean bungee. I use the bungee. I start at a low hike. Pick one area to emphasize, okay? There are so many, and I'm gonna have at the end, 
Um, a list of troubleshooting areas. I can't believe I used a bone cell in time. I'll go fast. Um, pick one area to emphasize. There are so many things that can go wrong, you'll totally overwhelm them, and they won't know which, which part to correct first. Okay? Um, and then videotape. I videotape and practice constantly because they think they're doing one thing and they're really doing something else. They will swear they've gone over the bar upside down. And you will show them that they are literally sitting and their head is like three feet higher than their butt. It's so helpful for them to see, especially young kids, so helpful for them to see themselves going over the bar. We only do, we have a meet in a week. I might not even let kids do full approaches over the bar. Full approach jumping is hard on your legs and it takes recovery. So we are not doing full approach jumping three days a week. Okay, it is once a week over the bar, and it is limited time on full jumps, like three, and you're done. We do a lot more short approach work, because you can give them the same cues um, as you do in full approach. So this is just an example of, this is what you want things to look like, and I've got it in slow motion. But this is a kid who, he's a football player, who had never high jumped, but was really happy. And I'm like, we can work with that. We can work with that. And he um, spent a lot of time doing popovers on his own because he, I showed him how he was sitting over the bar. His back was very flat. So he spent a lot of time doing popovers to get that form. I mean, if you could see what he started with compared to what he is now, don't give up on those kids just because they don't get it right away. Um, so, tro some troubleshooting. Intention of first step, I talked about. Speed of approach, I talked about. Shape of approach. Again, if you're not seeing the J approach, it is not correct and we need to fix that. Um, location of takeoff, I talked about how far they need to be out. Number one problem is kids take off too close to the bar. They hit it on the way up, because they're way too close. It feels far to them, but it's not. It's not. Um, direction of takeoff foot. So here's another thing kids do, and I've got a video that I want to quick show you. Your foot should be like a 45 degree angle to the bar. A lot of kids flatten it out and go parallel. But if you don't videotape, you won't catch that. There are so many things, so many technical areas at the high jump if you're not videotaping, you can't physically watch for all of that as they're jumping. You just can't do it. And until you play it back, you won't see, you know, direction of lean at takeoff. So many kids, they'll go into the turn leaning the appropriate way, but then when you watch the video and slow it down, you see they're leaning into the bar before they, their foot's even left the ground, they're already leaning into the bar. They're not going up before they go over. But if you don't video that, you won't catch it. Um, using arms instead of leaving them here. Head lay back and arch. Lifting your hips over the bar instead of dropping. Legs together, I'll show you a quick video on that. And don't forget your ending leg kick. Okay, so this was one of our, this is one of my eighth graders from last year. That is classic eighth grade high jump. <laughs> Swore to me, he went over upside down swore to me, but I could feel my head laying back. I'm like, on what planet? <laughs> it's like practically touching your chest. Okay, now he can clear five feet with just his butt. But you hit a ceiling of the height you can go over if you have no high jump form. You just really do. Okay, so um, my next kid, he's a good, he's another eighth grade jumper with pretty good form. But if I slow this down, Look at it at the direction his foot is planted. Opposite of where he wants to go. And then he does not kick his feet, he just lets his legs slide over the bar and pulls it off. So he had plenty of height, but was very passive in the air. Okay, so this last one, I, he was a senior last year, a basketball player. He high jumped because he was so poppy. But, uh, there are so many things wrong with them. 
Um, you can decide. I mean, he's leaning the wrong way. His legs are splayed. He has no head lay back. He didn't quite take off from where he should go. He cleared 6-2, but there is a ceiling to where I could get him over because, oh, he could just never get that arc. I mean, it's, and I asked him if I could show this, and he laughed and said, sure. Because it's just, everything is, I mean, this is how a classic how not to high jump. <laughs> everything, okay? So what I, if you didn't get the handout, I have up here, quick, a cheat sheet for troubleshooting. Um, so if something happens, visually you can see it and just check on the sheet. Because if you're not a high jump coach, this isn't second nature to you. I can look at things because I've done it my entire life and go, yeah, I know that that's, that's why that happened. But when you start out, you don't. And this is a nice handy little sheet to kind of give you, you don't have to go and do all the research. It's, it's here. So when your kid does something, you can go, oh, you knocked the bar up on the way down. Hmm, you're probably doing one of these two things. And just look for that. Um, so I know we had to kind of rush through the end, but really, the important stuff is the drill work that you do on the front side with new kids, as opposed to the jumping stuff on the back side. Yes? I saw ramps being used. Do you use them quite a bit? A what? Ramps. Yes, with the better kids we do because it, it's a good way to help them learn body position. When you get to like 6'5", you're hanging in the air a lot longer and they don't know what to do with themselves. So having them go off like a box or a ramp or a gymnastic springboard allows them to be in the air longer to work on controlling their body parts. So I don't use that usually with new kids, but I use that with kids who have jumped. The, the ones you can buy in the catalogs go around $300 to $400. If you're handy, you can make one for about 80 Yeah. Or you can check with your gymnastics program. We got one because they were getting rid of theirs and wanted a new one, so we snatched it. <laughs> we scavenged. So if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Um, I just love track. I love coaching track. I want it to be a great experience for all kids who come off the track, not just my super duper good kids, um, which is why I encourage everyone to do high jump track. So thank you for being with us.